this affects everyone. Let me let me ask you this. Which is more valuable in our culture? Is it the unborn eagle or the unborn child? In our culture, you're right, it's the unborn eagle. You can receive a $5,000 fine in a federal jail term for merely disturbing the nest in which there is an egg in the unborn eagle. And yet there are so-called physicians who receive thousands upon thousands of dollars for purposely taking the lives of unborn children. Now, why is this? It's because we have accepted the religion of evolution, which says that the unborn eagle and the unborn child are both equal in value because they're both a product of the same system of chance. Now, one may be more highly evolved than another, but they're both equal in value because they're both a product of chance. So then here's a question. Why is the eagle protected and the child not protected? Because there are fewer eagles and there are unborn children. So suddenly, the unborn eagle becomes more equal than the unborn child. Now, the logic is skewed unless you start with their underlying assumption. And then it makes perfect sense. That's why worldviews matter. Worldviews are, are the set of glasses through which you see the world around you. It's how you filter reality. Dr. M Michael Tooley's position, he wrote a book in the mid 80s in which he advocated that a child, a newborn, Baby should not be declared human until three days after birth so that the parents could decide whether or not to keep it alive. This was in the 80s. Now, he's teaching graduate students in philosophy. And we wonder why we are where we are. He said, since I do not believe human infants are persons, but only potential persons, and since I think that the destruction of potential persons is a morally neutral action, the correct conclusion seems to me to be that infanticide is in itself morally acceptable. He said this, in conclusion then, it is far from clear that the commonly accepted distinction between active and passive euthanasia is morally significant. I've tried to argue in some detail that the distinction between killing and letting die is not morally significant in itself. Your tax dollars paid his salary, by the way. If evolution is true, not only have you thrown away the ability to know anything for certain, but beyond that, there's no meaning or significance. There's no law, only exploitation. The strong survive, the powerful rule. There is no purpose, only survival. There's no basis for morals or ethics. There's no love, only hormones. And chance and chaos become the ultimate realities. Now, the question is, can anyone, creationist or evolutionist, Christian or non-Christian, live with that? That's a direct result of buying into an evolutionary world. Let me ask you this. Because you're looking a little bored with me already. Just a little group precipitation get to make you sweat. What is the candle right side up or upside down? And this, this requires a verbal response. Yes. <laughs> Your first question should be what? Which candle? Okay, well, well, it happens to be the one right there in the middle. It happens to be that candle right there. Okay, is it right side up or upside down? I could get both answers because it would depend on which set of lenses you choose through which you view the candle. If you view it through a positive lens, it appears to be upside down. If you view it through two prisms, it appears to be right side up. Does the candle change? No, what changes? It is your Perception, it is your worldview. It's the set of lenses through which you are viewing it. So when it comes to these issues, it's either you view it from a creationist perspective or you view it through a set of lenses learned by evolution. But 
it does beg the question, what do we mean by creation? Now, again, I am an old bonehead English teacher. So I'm not going to get technical here. It's going to be a layman set of definitions that we're going to have to agree on. So first, what is creation? What well, matter and life were brought into being by the living eternal creator. The existence of every system in the material universe is the result of intelligent design. Everything in the universe has a purpose and a function. And I claim, and this is the big one, that the creator is the God of the Bible. Now, any problems with this as a working definition of creation? Any problems? Okay. So we also need to define what evolution is, right? Evolution says that all the material universe is a result of chance arrangements of atoms responding to known physical and chemical laws. That life arose from non-living material and the diversity of living systems is the result of random mutations acted upon by natural selection. Any problems with that as a working definition of evolution? Okay, so we all agree that these are the working definitions. How does this play out in our culture? Well, for science, creation versus evolution is often, the debate is often portrayed as faith versus facts, right? It is often portrayed as non-science versus true science. Or it's often portrayed as being religion versus reality. But you go back to the definitions, and that's not the case. Is evolution a fact or a theory? It's not even a good theory. Because in geometry, you can prove theories, right? Or disprove them. But it's beyond the scope of that. Both of these are beyond the scope of science. In fact, Eugenie Scott, who for years was the executive director of the National Center for Science Education. She visited Denver. Uh, she used to, uh, she actually followed me around one time when I was doing tours and then reported on, reported on me that I was a dangerous person. But she said in a quote in the Denver Post, she said, evolution is a theory. It's much more important than a fact. Because theories explain things. Now, this is a committed evolutionist who's drawing the curtain back and telling you what evolution is. It's not science. It's not even a good philosophy of science. It's a theory that explains things. Stephen Jay Gould is said to have said this. Every fact must be interpreted in light of theory. Just the fact. And what do they say all the time? Just give me what? The facts. Just give me the facts. How many times have we heard that in the past two and a half years? Just give me the science. Just give me the facts. No, no. Science is not a way of knowing truth. It's just a way of sorting. Facts have to be interpreted in light of theory. Science is the legitimate daughter of Christianity, specifically of creationism. All of the great advances in science, some of which are listed on the screen, have been made by Christians who understood that there was order in the universe, that there was a creator who put that order in the universe, and their job was to go out and discover the order. All we have to do is look at science. I think it was Alfred North Whitehead who said that science displays the rationality of God. I mean, just a few of these, for example, uh, Lister, yeah. we, we know it as the product on the shelf, Lister ring, Lister ring. Lister, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, he, he was almost thrown out of the medical field because he insisted on something that, that was, oh, it was revolutionary. Uh, 
many women in childbirth would die in hospitals. And the reason is because doctors would go from one patient to the next without washing hands. Lister proposed, I know this is a radical idea, that physicians should wash their hands between patients. What an absurd idea, right? What an absurd idea. The number of, and he was almost driven out. He was mocked. He was vilified for suggesting that. That was such a radical idea. The great advances in science have been made by those who understood there was a creator who put order into the universe. Isaac Newton often broke out in praise as he did experiments, and he would write his experiments down, and he would break out in praise to God for what he saw. And yet, we have scientists who are in denial. Oxford scientist and author Richard Dawkins. It is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. Creation benefits all. And I submit that we must learn to bear the truth about creation, no matter how pleasant it may be. The great advances in science were brought about for one reason. In fact, these are the words that should trip off the tip of your mind when you are asked, why do you do what you do? Why do you do your homework? Back in the back row. Why are you kind to your younger siblings? Those of you who are on the next to last row. Why do you do your job with integrity? Why do you raise a family? Should be four words that trip off the tip of your mind. And those four words are, it's because of the creator. Because of the creator. When it comes to law and ethics, if you hold to an evolutionary worldview, then individual worth is merely extrinsic. It has no value other than what that life can benefit society or what that life can produce. The individual only has worth if he can contribute to society. The strong survive, the powerful rule, arbitrary laws are created by elite rulers. Everybody to go, hmm, hmm. I think we've seen that in the past two and a half years. Have we not? Private property. Now, I'm not just talking about physical property. I'm talking about your mind, your body, and the fruit of your labors. Private property is tenuous or non-existent at best. Personhood is defined by arbitrary rules, as are the laws that govern their actions. We live in one of the most pro-abort states in the nation. You realize that it was... Uh, uh, Richard Lamb, who became governor, who I think he was a senator at the time, but he's the one who proposed the abortion rights laws here in Colorado. He was a Democrat. You know who signed them into law? Who, you know who the governor was at the time? He was a Republican. Governor Love. I was doing a tour of the state capitol with a group of students, and I came to the portraits in, in the main hall, and there's Governor Lamb, was governor, and, and Governor Love, and a security guard over, came over, and he reminded me of that, and he said, isn't it interesting that in the name of love, thousands and thousands of little lambs are being led to the slaughter? Ideas do have consequences. Good ideas, excellent consequences, bad ideas, devastating consequences. And those ideas rest on a foundation, a worldview foundation 
that is either creationist or evolutionist. In fact, here's the most frightening thing. The group takes precedence over the individual. You as an individual do not matter if you hold to an evolutionary world. And some of you are going, well, I don't think I buy it. Okay, well, let's just step back a little bit. <clears throat> Adolf Hitler said this, the individual is nothing. The group, referring to the Nazi party, is everything. But you're saying, well, that was Hitler. Hitler claimed, you know, he was, he was a, a Christian. No, he did not. In fact, we'll talk about that in a minute. But you must understand that when group rights get the upper hand, gone are the inalienable rights given to the individual by the creator. When group rights take precedence, your individual rights are gone. You no longer have inalienable rights. If you hold to a creationist worldview, it's a whole different system. The individual worth flows from the creator. Laws are absolute and creator reveals. Even society's weakest receive protection. Property rights result in a free market. Personhood is defined by the creator, as are his laws that govern those rights and mankind. And above all, the individual matters. The individual matters supremely. Jesus didn't come to die for the group. Jesus came to die for you and for you and for me. There is a clash of world views. Why do we have law? Why do we have ethics? It's four words. What are those four words? I can't remember them. What are they? Oh, that was pretty weak. What are they? It's because of the creator. Because of the creator. When it comes to human relations and public charity, this is where we're going to camp out a little bit. When it comes to human relations and public charity, if you hold to an evolutionary worldview, who said this? He who does not wish to fight in this world where permanent struggle is the law of life has not the right to exist. I do not see why man should not be just as cruel as nature. Any ideas who said that? Adolf Hitler. In fact, evolutionist Sir Arthur Keith said, the German Fuhrer, as I have consistently maintained, is an evolutionist. He has consciously sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. Now, you must understand that that had consequences. You may even remember this film, Schindler's List. I want you to think of how ideas have consequences when it comes to buying into an evolutionary worldview as opposed to a creationist worldview. Let's see if we can make this work. Leave your luggage on the platform. Clearly label it. Make them first. Send your survey. Do not bring your baggage with you. It will follow you later. Leave your luggage on the platform. Clearly label it. Yeah. 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 This gentleman thinks the mistakes been made. My plant manager is somewhere on the street. If it leaves with him on it, it will disrupt production and the elements for it will want to know why. Uh, 
Please come to the list. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, the list is correct, sir. There's nothing I can do. What is your name? My name? My name is Kunda. Hauptsache, oh, yeah, Kunda. What's yours? Schindler. S E H I N D E R. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I think I can guarantee you, you'll both be in southern Russia before the end of the month. Good day. Stern! 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 It's our Stern! Ideas do have consonants. Good ideas, excellent consonants. Bad ideas, devastating consonants. That particular scene may speak more poignantly to me than it does to you because you see my father was a World War II artillery spotter pilot. Flew a single engine plane, the only weapon he carried was a pistol and a shoulder holster. And as most World War II vets, he didn't talk much about his experiences, but he did write down some of his recollections. If I recall as a child, my parents often had people over after church on Sunday night or Wednesday night, and a group of the men were talking about their experiences from World War II, thinking that my sister and I were asleep in the back bedroom, but I was awake, and I recall vividly crying myself to sleep and terror at what I heard them recall. Later in life, my dad wrote down some of his recollections. In one, he wrote, Near the close of the war, the 9th Armored Division had pulled back from Leipzig, Germany for rest. We were then to plunge into Czechoslovakia. Another pilot and I flew to nearby Weimar, where the infamous Buchenwald concentration camp had just been liberated. 
Buchenwald was especially notorious because of the commandant's wife. She earned a nickname, which I can't repeat, but she earned it. Her office was furnished in a very grisly way. Uh, human skulls for ashtrays. Lampshades made of human skin. We felt compelled to see if what we had heard was true. It was, and worse. After a horrifying inspection of two hours, I stood at the furnaces where emaciated, naked, mutilated bodies still were piled in the furnace cards. A stench of burned flesh and bodies still choked the air about the now still gas furnaces. I climbed a short ladder to stand on the earth covered roof above the torture room that housed the body stripping tables. In Buchenwald, Prisoners were processed on one level and then they were thrown down a wooden chute where they landed on a table. And then other prisoners would then beat their teeth out to retrieve any gold fillings. These prisoners, of course, were still alive. So what you saw was not license for a movie, it was reality. My dad continued. I stooped and scooped up a hand full of earth beneath my feet, and it felt strangely loose and spongy. My mind was clogged with the incomprehensible inhumanity to man that I had witnessed. It was then that I saw that the spongy dirt I absently let trickle from my palm through my fingers was not dirt at all. It was human ashes, small fragments of crushed, charred bone. In horror, I held for one moment in the palm of my trembling hand, a helpless Jewish baby, a frantic young mother, a bewildered Jewish boy, a tottering grandmother. They drifted from my hand to rejoin the host of unknown, unremembered, nameless human beings who died in these furnaces before and with them. Ideas have consequences. And I know that, that many of you are thinking what I thought when I first read that, and that is if only I'd been there, I would have. The answer is no, you wouldn't have. No, I wouldn't have, because by the time those trains were running, it was too late. The worldview of the Nazis had laid those tracks a decade prior to the Holocaust. That's why worldviews matter. And that's why this whole issue of origins matters. Because if we abandon a biblical worldview, then we are on a sea of opinions with a million options and no compass to guide us. Because evolution offers no compass. People will tell you, get on board with my worldview. I said that a worldview is often described as a set of glasses through which one filters reality. Perhaps a, a more poignant illustration would be one's worldview is much like a train. One tends to climb on board as a child, not thinking about where the train is headed. One just goes along for the ride. In Luke 11.52, Jesus told a group of lawyers, you have taken away the key of wisdom, taken away the key of knowledge. Begs the question, doesn't it? What's the key of knowledge? Everybody go, hmm, what's key of knowledge? Proverbs 1, Proverbs 9 tells us. What is it? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Here's a question for you. Is that the basis for every subject that is taught in the secular schools in our communities? If it is not, and why are we sacrificing our children on the altar of evolution? The evolutionist position? Who said this? Darwin's book is very important and serves me as a basis in natural science for the class struggle in history. Karl Marx. Karl Marx. Margaret Sanger, 
founder of Planned Parenthood, said this, more children from the fit, less children from the unfit. This is the chief issue of birth control. You think that's in their literature they pass out to women, especially those who are in certain sections of cities where they place their clinics, excuse me, their abortion bills. Sanger said this, apply a stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation to that grade of population whose progeny is tainted or whose inheritance is such that objectionable traits may be transmitted to offspring. So here's the question, who's gonna decide what an objectionable trait is? Well, it's certainly gonna be her, is it not? I would urge you to look up an interview that Dan Rather did with Margaret Sanger. You can find it on YouTube, Brother Chilling. Margaret Sanger. These two words, birth control, sum up our whole philosophy. It means the release and cultivation of the better elements in our society and the gradual suppression, elimination, and eventual extinction of defective stocks. Those human weeds which threaten the blooming of the finest flowers of American civilization. She called certain people groups human weeds. The roots of racism dig deep into evolution. In fact, in a letter, she said, we don't want the word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. Is any of this in the literature that Planned Parenthood hands out to victims known as pregnant women seeking relief. Francis Collins, who is just recently retired as the director of the National Institutes of Health, he was Anthony Fauci's boss. Francis Collins claims Christ as his savior. He's very vocal about his faith. In a recent, back in November, recent interview, I think it was with the Christian Post, he was asked about using fetal tissue from aborted babies to do research. Here's what he said. Suppose it was possible in a rare instance for something that's about to be discarded with full consent after the decision by the mother to be used to develop something that might save somebody's life. In that case, I think even God could look at that and go, okay, it's not the thing I would have wanted to see happening. Still as an ethical choice between discarding or using for some benevolent purpose, maybe that's defensible. Now that will make some people uneasy. What's the difference between that and what you just saw in Schindler's List in that clip where they were recycling all the possessions of those Jews that they were going to exterminate and discard. By the way, they would shave their hair and use the hair of the Jews. Why waste it? They're going to be discarded. Well, why not get some use out of it? Racism's roots dig deep into the model of evolution. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is look at the subtitle of Darwin's book. Origin of Species. And you know what it says, right? It says, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. The preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Do you know who came up with the idea of eugenics? It was Charles Darwin's cousin who was very influenced by Darwin's book, Francis Galt came up with the idea of eugenics. 
It really means good stock or good beginnings. Is that not what you just heard in the quotes from Margaret Sanger? Now, eugenics is rejected, has been rejected officially, even by the National Human Genome Research Institute. On its website, here's how they describe eugenics. Eugenics is a scientifically erroneous and immoral theory. Hmm, it's interesting, immoral. On what basis is it immoral? Immoral theory of, quote, racial improvement, end quote, and, quote, planned breeding, end quote, which gained popularity during the 20th, early 20th century. Eugenicists worldwide believe they could, they could perfect human beings and eliminate so-called social ills through genetics and heredity. They believe the use of methods such as involuntary sterilization. Why don't we just substitute vaccination for sterilization? Methods such as involuntary sterilization, segregation, and social exclusion. Oh, don't wear a mask and see what happens. Would rid society of individuals deemed by them to be unfit. Scientific racism is an ideology that appropriates the methods and legitimacy of science to argue for the superiority of white Europeans and the inferiority of non-white people whose social and economic status have been historically marginalized. Like eugenics, scientific racism grew out of, one, the misappropriation of revolutionary advances in medicine, anatomy, and statistics during the 18th and 19th centuries. Number two, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution through the me mechanism of natural selection. Number three, Gregor Mendel's laws of inheritance. Eugenic theories and scientific racism drew support from contemporary xenophobia, anti-Semitism, sexism, colonialism, and imperialism, as well as justifications of slavery, particularly in the United States. That's from the National Human Genome Research Institute. That's how they define eugenics. And yet, have they rejected it? Do they condemn Planned Parenthood? Do they condemn what we're seeing today? And the answer is no. They just define it. They don't reject it. Evolution is the foundation for racism. Now, hear me carefully. I'm not saying that all evolutionists are racist. That would be absurd. In fact, evolutionists may not be racist, but evolution by nature is racist. And we need to start saying it. We've been timid about it. Or we haven't connected the dots, perhaps. If you connect the dots, here's where you end up. Remember Jeffrey Dahmer, mass murderer? Not only was he a mass murderer, he, he did gross things. He, he kept body parts in his refrigerator. He was cannibalistic as well. In an interview with Stone Phillips, shortly before he was murdered in prison, not Stone Phillips, Jeffrey Dahmer, he said this, if a person doesn't think there is a God to be accountable to, then, then, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. I always believe the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from the slime. When we, when we died, you know, that was it. There is nothing. Let's bring it home. Not too far from here, there's a site that rocked this nation, Columbine High School. And when that occurred, I, I recall listening to talk show after talk show and guest after guest trying to analyze why those two shooters did what they did at Columbine. The answer is very simple. They learned their lessons well. Now hear me carefully, I'm not saying some teacher told them to go out and shoot people, that would be absurd. But from the day they entered the system until the day they pulled the trigger, they were trained to think that they were nothing more than mistakes of nature. So why not live fast, die young, and leave a good-looking corpse? 
For me, it's too late. What's the opposing worldview of this? It's a biblical worldview. It's Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Individuals are not just members of a group. Individuals are people. They have value and worth because they bear the image of the creator. What does it mean to, to be the image of the creator? It's an interesting thought, right? I mean, does that mean I look like God? What does that mean? Well, if you went to France as uh, an ambassador of the United States, what would you be in France? You would be the United States. You would have the authority of the United States. To say that we are his image is more than just we bear his image. We are the image of the creator. We represent Christ here and now. I'm not talking about Mormonism either, okay? Don't confuse that. What I'm talking about is that we are the image of the creator. We are his representatives. We are his ambassadors on this planet. And we need to proclaim truth and grace. And it starts with the foundation of creation. If you opt into an evolutionary mindset or an evolutionary foundation, you are on a slippery slope and you have no basis for making judgments. And you have no basis for saying racism is wrong. We've all seen, we've seen the textbooks, the progression from lower life forms to man, right? You see them in the museums. What do they always start with? What color skin? Dark skin. What do they end up with? Piece of white bread like me. That's racism. And flows directly from Darwin's book and his subtitle for the preservation of the favored races. It is not a misrepresentation as evidenced by his cousin, Francis Galt. What's happened because of the creator, because of the creator, because of the creator. We have hospitals and charitable organizations founded to honor the creator's handiwork. Education for all. Education is a byproduct of creationist mindset. It was the Moravians who came up with the idea that every child should be educated. Poor, rich, noble, ignoble, in order to train the creator's handiwork. Slavery was abolished by Christians. William Wilberforce in England, because he and a group of men worked tirelessly for over 26 years to bring about a legalized end to slavery. Christian charity and decency are a result of a Christian mindset. Organizations from the YMCA to the, to the Red Cross to the Salvation Army, even animal humane societies are a direct result of a creationist mindset. If you're going to say that evolution benefits mankind, you are deluded. You are insane, and you will be wicked. <clears throat> Why are we benefiting from all of this? Four words. What are those four words? No, I can't hear you. Because I still can't hear you. Because of the creator. It's because of the creator. Because of the creator. And it all rests upon how you know what you know. It rests on your epistemology. How do you know? Well, if you hold to an evolutionary mindset, since everything happens by chance, the individual too is a product of chance, as is his brain. Thoughts become just random secretions of one's brain. Therefore, one can never know if what he is thinking is true and accurate. Right and wrong, without a way of knowing truth, no action, no idea can be deemed right or wrong. Anything is permissible. Jeffrey Dahmer should not have been persecuted, persecuted for being accountable if we buy into an evolutionary worldview. By the way, do you know that, that 
uh, he was ministered to by a pastor who, de who deliberately went to that prison and got permission to see him. And shortly before Dahmer was murdered in prison, he professed Christ. When I get to heaven, I get to shake hands with a cannibal. Wow, God's grace. Because I get to heaven. And again, evolutionists may have morality, but evolution has none, nor can it offer a morality. Frederick Nietzsche, founder of nihilism, went insane, by the way. Remember that quote early on by Dawkins? If you don't believe in evolution, you're stupid or insane. Nietzsche went insane, died in an insane asylum. But he said this, when one gives up Christian belief, one thereby deprives oneself of the right to Christian morality. Christianity presupposes that man does not know, cannot know what is good for him and what is evil. He believes in God, who alone knows. This atheist got it better than most Christians do. Why do we know? Four words. What are those four words? Because it's because of the creator. So which model most benefits society? Evolution celebrates death. Evolution encourages selfishness. Just in 70 years, over 190 million people, and that's a conservative estimate, were sacrificed on the altar of evolution. We always hear, oh, oh, the Crusades. Oh, oh, the religious wars. If you want to play the numbers game, which I think is absurd, if you add up all the people, and you can be very generous and you can pad the numbers, who have died in the name of Christianity, you've been killed in the name of Christianity, it's like 17 million. It's a lot. If you want to play a numbers game, and I think it's absurd, just in 70 years, 190 plus, and that is a conservative estimate, were purposely sacrificed on the altar of evolution. Now notice I said 17 million in the name of Christian, not because of Christian. By contrast, creation celebrates life. Creation encourages followers to be selfless. Hospitals, charities, schools, all of those result in millions being benefited. The names on hospitals should tell you alone. That should be proof enough. You don't see names of atheist hospitals. Baptist hospital, Lutheran hospital, right? They were founded by Christians. You don't find hospitals founded by Hindus. Their worldview does not permit it. It does not allow for charity. It's only a biblical worldview that results in this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor during the time that Hitler came to power. He saw what was happening. He fled. He immigrated to the United States. But he was only here for a short time because he felt called by God to return to Germany, and he started an underground seminary to train pastors. He was part of what was called the Confessing Church. There are two churches, groups in Germany at the time. There was the German Christian Church and the Confessing Church. Now, I thought German Christian, oh, that's like American Christian. No, 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 no. The German Christian Church supported Hitler. They hung the swastika above the altar in German Christian churches. They replaced the Bible with Mein Kampf. They would baptize babies by wrapping them in the flag of the swastika. They supported him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was part of the Confessing Church, and the Confessing Church pastors, they spoke out against him. And what happened was Bonhoeffer was jailed. 
and he was eventually hanged in his cell with piano wire shortly before the war ended. Bonhoeffer said, if you board the wrong train, it's no use running along the corridor in the opposite direction. If your worldview is much like a train, your worldview is going to carry you where it's going to carry you. You need to switch tracks. In our culture, we need to switch tracks. We need to put the train on a different track, a track that leads to life and not death. And so we need to go out and proclaim the truth and the benefits of a creationist world. We're getting what we deserve. We've allowed it to be preached from the pulpits. We pour it into the brains and the minds of students for 12 years in secular schools. We wink at it when we see it in films like Jurassic Park. And we don't call it for what it is. It's evil. I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you a job. Your job is to build a prison. Now, you can use whatever technology you want. You can invent technology. There's only one stipulation. You must make the prison escape proof. So what would you do? I know some of you are thinking, I would put them in a coffin and bury them. No, they, they have to be kept alive. Okay, that's the only stipulation. But it must be escape proof. Some of you think, I'll put it on the moon. No, I'll put steel bars around it. I, I'll, I'll put it at the bottom of the ocean and pump oxygen. in. What's the best prison to build? It is a prison in which the prisoner does not even realize he's in prison because then he'll never do what? Try to escape. We are all prisoners of our assumptions. That's not bad if your assumptions are true. But if your assumptions are false, it can be devastating. For example, if I assume that I can climb to the top of this building and step off and flap my arms and fly off towards the mountains, that would have a deadly conclusion. Ideas have consequences. Your assumptions determine your conclusions. We have an entire culture who have been fed the lie of evolution. And the conclusion is death. Death of education, death of liberty, death of prosperity, death of creativity. Evolution is more than a science issue. It is a worldview issue. Best evidence for evolution is the assumption that evolution is true. Best evidence for creation? Four words. Because of the creator. Because of the creator. Why did science flourish? Because of the creator. Why do we have law? Because of the creator. How do you know? Because of the creator. Why is racism wrong? Because of the creator. Go out and tell people. Just ask some questions. When they ask you, why do you do what you do? What do you tell them? Because of the creator. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the patience of everybody here this evening. Thank you for um, then braving the elements to come. I trust and pray that the truth of your word will encourage and equip us to go out and proclaim the truth of your word from beginning to end, from the foundation of origins until you return. Thank you for this evening. Help us to think hard and think well. I ask this for Jesus. Amen. Uh, by the way, um, I do have an announcement, and that is that uh, I work for Worldview Academy. Worldview Academy is a Christian leadership training program for students 13 to 18. We mainly do it at camps throughout the summer all across the country. Uh, we train them in three 
things and worldviews, uh, evangelism and apologetics, how to share and defend the faith, and then servant leadership skills. I've been doing this for 26 years. So two months out of the summer, I'm on the road all over the country. I have the best job in the world because you get to work with students who want to make a difference. It's a leadership camp. It's not a come get your unsafe brain safe camp. There are camps for that. It's not a fun junkie camp. I mean, they're in class 29 hours out of the week. That's pretty intense. We also do a bridge year program down in Canyon City for students who are just out of high school who want to get grounded in their faith before they hit college or their career path. And I teach world news and I teach civics. I go down there once a week. But I was recently asked and have agreed to run for House District 45, Castle Rock mainly, Castle Pines and the Piney, uh, by the term limited representative. And I realized that I couldn't walk back into my classroom and teach it if I wasn't willing to put feet on it. So I'm a candidate for House District 45. And I would appreciate your prayers. I'd appreciate your support through that. If you happen to be in my district, please attend your caucus and become a delegate and vote for me. But I'd appreciate your prayers. There's a flyer out on the table, and you can check out my website, check out worldview.org, find out what we offer your students, and find out more about me at my other website. So I have two hats to me. But thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Sure. Okay, so uh, now I guess we can, uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, we can field those questions. And uh, if you have a question, raise your hand, let me know about it. I'll bring the mic to you so you can answer, ask it so that everybody else can hear. And just a second. Is there any way you can find people's questions if they're coming from Zoom? Do you know how to do that? Let me check. Because if you can, then you, you can field questions from them as well. So, um, oh, he's checking that. Does anybody have any questions? Or do you have a question? All you need is one question. Okay, over here. Wait till this. Have you ever heard of the book, None of These Diseases? Yes. Yeah. And a Dr. Semmelweis that did the same thing as Mr. Lister, showing that even though you couldn't see the bacteria, they would go from the dead mothers to the living mothers. And when they washed their hands, the death rate dropped. Yes. Like you almost, he got kicked out of his hospital and went from one place to another because the other doctors Doctor Cleans or something, right? Yeah, and and that book, none of these diseases, is a, is a great book because here the children of Israel had been immersed in a pagan culture in Egypt for four hundred plus years. The Egyptians were brilliant architects, brilliant builders. We still don't know really how they how they built and the pyramids, for example, but. Because of their worldview, they thought diseases were brought on by offending one of their multitudes of gods. I mean, they even had a, a little um, headstand, headrest at night, like our pillows. They would put their head on it, and on that were carved incantations to protect them from nightmares. Okay? They lay down in fear, and they rose in fear. Okay? What you fear is what you worship. Now, they had some rather strange remedies for common problems, like for baldness, they recommended that you wear a donkey dung on your head. Now, I've tried a lot of things. Ain't going there. Ain't going there. But for a cut, they would say wrap dung around it. No wonder the average lifespan of an Egyptian was 35 years. 
Okay. So none of these diseases it demonstrates that when God brought the Israelites out after having been immersed in this pagan culture with such stupid practices, okay, that he brought them out, he gave them an entire new, entirely new set of hygienic practices. And it was beneficial. And they did not have the diseases that had been visited upon the Egyptians because they followed God's commands. That's the premise and the basis for the book. Am I correct on that? Yeah, I, I use that book. I had uh, my doctor at the time, a uh, great Christian man, um, has since gone to be with the Lord, but I invited him to go with me to the museum. And when I would take groups through, they had uh, uh, an exhibit on Ramses, and occasionally he would go with me and he would explain that very thing to groups of people that I took through the museum. It was a hoot. I mean, we'd be standing in the in the room with the sarcophagus of Ramses. It was like a third-hand sarcophagus because tomb robbers had come in and, and you know plundered the tomb. They even dumped his body out and unwrapped it. You know. <laughs> Not they didn't do that, but to, to get the jewels off his body. But they preserved the bodies because they thought they would be needed in the afterlife. Worldview drove everything. Fear drove everything. And we'd stand in that room, which was packed. All was in there was a third hand sarcophagus. Because the mummy, they wouldn't let it out of Egypt because they thought it was, had to stay there. Because if they put it out of Egypt, then the soul would roam the earth. Okay? So we'd stand in there, and in a very loud voice, I'd say, Hey, if you want to fall down and worship, go ahead. Because this guy thought he was God. I, I worship the true God. It's amazing what you can do in a museum to proclaim the gospel. And my doctor, he, he talked very eloquently and clearly about none of these diseases. So you can do that. You can do that in museums. Sorry, I went off on a team. Brought back memories. Anybody have any more questions? Let's see if there's any in the chat here. I guess I'm brilliant. <laughs> oh, it's back to you, isn't yes, it? Spotlight has to be on you, doesn't it? Skeptic. So there is a museum talking about how he did the pyramids. Yeah. There is a person who doesn't get a lot of uh, accolades, but he discovered how they built the pyramids by finding a dog leg piece of wood inside one of the pyramids. No kidding. They put a a tool together, a mechanical device, and four men raised a two-ton SUV six feet into the air using this device. They went over to the pyramids, and while there was a Japanese film crew, they showed that they could lift stones from one level to another. And this museum is in America. No kidding. I, I can, I'll give you yeah, I'd like the link on that. It's kind of like I've, 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 you've seen guys move refrigerators and appliances. You know, they have the straps that go around. And it's really clever and, and quite you know, good at, it, at moving heavy objects with just using two guys. Okay. I can sit around and watch you do it all day long. <laughs> man, man is creative. creative. You must understand, we, we reflect the nature of our creator. We, we are very creative people. If you start with a worldview that says, because of the creator, it's amazing what we have accomplished. Okay? Now, I know that, that many of us are discouraged by what's going on, what we see around us, but this is the best time to be alive. So you got to realize that. And, I mean, okay, let me ask you this one. Buddy of mine is a pastor, and he asked me, he said, would you rather be alive today or 50 years ago? Would you rather be alive today or 100 years ago? Would you rather be alive today or 1,000 years ago? And I'm going, hmm, now, look at all that we have around us 
from which we benefit. I'm talking about just anybody because of the creativity of mankind, because we reflect the nature of our creator. We provide solutions to problems, yeah, that happen, but we provide and discover solutions. It's a great time to be alive. Don't be discouraged. You need to proclaim truth and grace. Well, I guess I'll ask a question then. Uh-oh. How do you go about getting the boldness that you need to confront this culture the way we really need to do it? Uh, just ask questions. Just go out and ask questions. Um, I told you about the, about the Bridger program down in Canyon City. One of the things we do with our students is, is we don't cloister them. It's held in old Abbey. Okay, it's, so we don't issue howls and teach them the glory and chants. And, but it used to have a boys' school, so they had dormitories, so we just rent space. But one of the things we do is we, our students have to be engaged in the community. And we take them out to a park, a city park that is right across from the high school. The high school has an open campus policy, so during lunch, students flow through the park, two blocks down to the fast food places, and we capture them in conversation. Well, of course, being a public park and students, it draws drug dealers, right? And so it's a problem. Every time we've been there, we've seen the police patrolling, but you can't really catch drug dealers in action. It's very hard. So what the school and the city came up with was to during daylight hours, five days a week, 180 days out of the year, they turned over this, the park to the school as school property. So now, if you're in the park and they don't want you there, then you're accused of trespassing. Well, what does that do to our students? And to me, when I go into the park to share my faith, our faith with students, it makes us what? Trespassing. So we're fighting it. Because I believe in liberty. I believe in free speech. By the way, you think that solves a drug dealing problem? You know where it moves it? Half a block down the alley. Just out of their sight. When they look out their office windows, the administrators don't have to see it. Right? So just last week, we've been, we've been fighting this for a long time. And just last week, I said, okay, we're going to up the end. Put a table in the park. Big banner, what are you thinking? And they couldn't avoid us. They couldn't ignore us. They knew we were there. But you know what happened? The security people gave us wide berth. They called the police. Police showed up. They, they huddled over here on the, on the street. They were on the phones, calling headquarters. Do you think any of those security or police officers approached any of our students or me? No. You don't have to be bold. Just exercise your liberties. You know who was scared? The security people were scared. The police were scared. They're scared of Christians. We have truth. We have grace. They're the ones who are afraid of us. And yet the culture is using fear to neutralize us. They're the ones that are fearful. When you fear the true creator, he does amazing things. He removes fear of everything else. Paul wrote about this. Neither height, nor death, nor life, nor death, but basically he created things in separation from the love of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Do you want to be fearless before people? Fear God. Easy to say. Hard to do. Okay. But yeah, we've been trained to be leashed by fear of man. What you fear is what you worship. Fear not having enough money, you worship material things. Fear not having enough friends, you, you worship people. Okay. I don't know if that answers your question. That goes a long way. <laughs> so just fear God, love people. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Hey. I'm serious. Thanks for coming out on such a um, glorious evening.
<laughs> it's moisty out there. Okay? We, we need the moisture. But we may we may end up spending the night here. So let's go, everybody. Okay. And I hope there are plenty of snacks. Uh, if you're interested in any of the materials I brought, if you have any questions that we didn't get to, I'll be out at the table. But thank you. So it's always a joy to be here. Thanks. <laughs>